To be a falcon, there are six species in our country. American kestrel is the smallest. I should ask you guys, do you guys know any other peregrines? We have six, or any other falcons? We have six. I told you peregrines. <laughs> which is the smallest. We have the Merlin, which is the next size up. We have the Peregrine Falcon and the Prairie Falcons, are about similar size. Then we have the Jeer Falcon, which is the biggest falcon in North America. That they, live up, um, they live up in the Arctic and, and way far north. Um, and then the sixth falcon we don't have around here, which is called the Apomato Falcon. It's in the southern U.S. Um, they're about the size of our Merlin, which is about a half a pound bird. Um, now what's interesting about the Jeer Falcon is that they will so she saw something. <laughs> what I think it was is um, the reflection. Oh, no. Do you see how she turned her head and her back? And I think she saw the falcon, uh, the, re the reflection. I'm actually going to feed her. I can use food as a distraction. I use that all the time, too. <laughs> so I'm going to give her some quail. This is all excitement that uh, when you flap it, it's kind of like I always think of it like, you know, the Domino's delivery hits the doorbell. I'm so excited. <laughs> So we'll see what she does. I cut it up in two pieces, but then I gave her a big chunk. So if she starts eating, I'll give her the big chunk so you guys can see her real. Natural behavior. Raptors kill with the feet. To define a raptor, hooked beak, talons, and good eyesight. That's simple. So they grab with the feet. That's the killing end of a raptor. And then they hold it, and they bring their beak down to their feet to eat. Now, parrots are the only birds in the world that can bring their foot up to their beak. So this is natural. Even though she's living in captivity, this is what they just do. Now, notice, she takes a bite, and she looks up. But she looks up, she takes a bite, and looks up. And the reason she does that, two reasons. One, she doesn't want to be eaten. So look at her, put her head down. She puts her head down, and she doesn't want to be grabbed. And she's distracted by with her food. So she makes sure she looks up so that she can actually see things that are coming at her. The other thing, she wants to make sure you're not going to take her quail dinner. Dare. <laughs> <laughs> so, but she doesn't know that. So she wants to make sure that she is going to have her safe dinner. She just used a lot of energy. You saw it in the video. 3,000 feet dives. Think about the energy to get up there, to sustain that, and they fly down and grab their dinner. Now, how they do it, they'll go 1,000 to 3,000 feet. When they get up, well, when they get to the height they want, they look down and they see their dinner. They're going to eat things as large as a, uh, a duck. They're nicknamed the duck hawk, even though they're not a hawk. Um, they're nicknamed the duck hawk, and they'll take things as small as a small songbird. The best size meal, just for perspective, is like a pigeon. Yeah, it's like a pigeon. So, I don't know a lot of you. And so, that's about the size. When they get close to their dinner, they'll slow down a little bit. So, they'll reach speeds of about 200 on average. Um, I know they've been clocked at over 240. And then they'll reach out with their big feet and either knock the dinner out of the air, or they'll just grab it with those super long pair of their toes. To, have, to be a falcon, some of the characteristics, number one, thin pointed wings built for speed. Number two, look at the long toes proportion of the body. That's so she can grab the entire bird out of the air and not just a handful of feathers. Because if she had stubby little toes and she grabbed that bird, well, that bird could break free and get maybe a little patch of missing feather. But they, these birds, uh, they want to make sure if they catch them that they actually have them. The other characteristic to look at, let's give her a big chunk here. But now there's rules. <laughs> like at home, if you have kids, or maybe going when you were growing up, maybe you had table rules. Well, these birds do as well. She has to have wings in. She has to be uh, looking away, and um, and so that's uh, um, the rule. So look, watch the change of behavior. And this is the animal training side of what I do. Look at the change, and so she has to show that good posture, and so wings in, look away. And then I can bridge. If you, guys ever go, if you guys ever go to like SeaWorld, you hear the whistle, that's the bridge. It's a secondary reinforcer. It tells them that, yes, you did what I'm asking, and that you get your reinforcer. So I try to capture that behavior by doing a bridge. Ours is a click with our, our, our mouth. You'll hear me do it. There, I could have done it right there. That looked really nice. Good posture. So I click, she gets it. So, so she's getting a nice big chunk. So characteristic of a falcon, we are talking about long toes, thin wings. Also, look under the eyes, black stripes. It's just like why our football players, our baseball players, our athletes will put black stripes under the eyes. It cuts the glare of the sun. If you guys think back to eighth grade science, black <laughs> absorbs light, white reflects light. So they don't want that glare, and so falcons all have that. Merlins, kestrels, falcons like uh, the peregrine here, they all have it. Now, this is... <laughs> 
She has to also have good posture by sitting forward. Um, so now, besides the black stripes, as you maybe never have been this close to a falcon, notice when she sits up. Look, this is kind of a weird, weird request, so I apologize. Um, look in her nose, okay? Now you'll notice a little button sticking out. Now that little button sticking out, if you were to look at an eagle, they don't have it. If you were to look at a hawk, they don't have it. Or an owl, they don't have it. Now what that little button does is it's called a baffle or a nose cone. They actually slows the speed of air down, allowing them to breathe. Because at high speeds, the air would actually go around the nose and not in it. So all falcons have it. Excuse me, have that. Yeah. So she's plucking. Look how efficient she is. No team, keep that in mind. And well, they need some of this material to pass it. They need it so in their second stomach, the gizzard, they can pack all the material the body can't use feathers, fur, bones, you know, branches, anything that they get on their food, and then they'll pack it together and pop up a pellet every 12 to 24 hours. Everyone knows of owl pellets, but there are eagle pellets and vulture pellets and falcon pellets. Um, so she needs some of that casting soft material. But it also shows you her level of hunger. If she was really hungry, well, she's eating pretty good, but she does actually probably not pick very much. She wouldn't pluck. So our birds, again, are very, very well fed. Um, so she's plucking some of that non-digestible material. Now, going back to the nose cone, if you notice that little button, it slows the speed of air. It allows them to breathe at high speeds. Pretty amazing. Now, the other thing to look at is the upper part of her beak, so the upper hook you'll notice a little notch, a little triangle. And what that does, it's actually called a tomial tooth. People call it a notch. It's not a tooth like we have a tooth, but what it does is that when they grab their dinner with their feet, they then will bite the base of the neck with their beak of the prey, bite the base of the neck, and they break the spinal cord using that little notch. Pretty amazing stuff. Only falcons have that. Your hawks don't have this notch, or the eagles don't either. So they all have these adaptations to be extremely, extremely successful. Um, as she's eating, you may also start to notice that her upper chest starts to bulge out a little bit, and that's actually the crop. It was mentioned in the video, and what the crop is is a holding tank. And so basically, they're going to eat, they're going to send it in their crop for, to hold it, So because the food is safer in their bodies than it is out in the open, because something else would come by and take this quail dinner. Um, so she wants it in her, and then as she gets to a safe place, she'll start to send it for digestion. The only group of uh, uh, raptors that do not have a crop are your owls. So they send it down, go into the stomach, the first stomach, and they have their second stomach. So these birds, oh, there we go. Um, so these birds um, are very, very efficient at what they're doing. Um, her story, this is a peregrine falcon. She came to us from the state of Michigan, um, and she came to us for rehabilitation when we in got... Arizona. Um, in our, our federal, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah different states, so permits, yeah. There definitely was going to be some, you know, talks about getting them here. But this bird here was shot illegally in the right wing. So somebody did shoot her. Um, she was uh, admitted to the clinic, determined non-releasable due to that wing injury. She can't sustain the flight that she needs. She has to be a tip-top shape. If she can't go at high speeds, if she can't maneuver, she's going to starve to death. That's, that's her case. So she is now an education bird. Um, in the wild, these guys would typically live, oh, early to mid-teens. In captivity, they could double that. Um, so into their 20s. And uh, what's she now? She is 14, I believe. Do they have predators themselves? Um, yeah, they do, actually. Uh, number one predator, people. So um, that brings up a great point to mention their history. This bird was near extinction. You're lucky to almost see this bird. 20, 30 years ago, you never would. This bird was um, affected by the pesticide DDT. What do you guys know about DDT? It's, it's poisonous because... Um, Deformities in the eggs, so make sure that's that part. And what else do we guys know? DDT? Bioaccumulation. Nice. Bioaccumulation, meaning that, so, so as a perspective here, so farmers sprayed it on the crops, insects died, small birds came around and ate the insects. So that small bird started to increase the concentration in them because they're eating a lot of insects. They come by and they eat multiple smaller birds with higher concentrations. Bioaccumulation starts to happen. They get higher dosage as a top predator. And what the pesticide did is it actually reacted with the calcium in the eggshell. And when they laid their eggs, like a, a two-pound peregrine like her, she would actually break her own eggs. They were thin and brittle. Eagles were affected by it as well. Not from farmers going onto the insects, but farmers and going into the water system and into the fish. Pelicans were affected. Ospreys. Um, other birds that are in the water were certainly affected. And then peregrines. So it took a lot of years to determine what was causing bird populations to drop dramatically to near extinction. And um, 
Rachel Carson wrote uh, Silent Spring, if you're familiar with that book, really started the environmental movement. And in 1972, DDT can no longer be used in, in our country. It doesn't mean that DDT isn't used in other parts of the world that are dealing with things such as malaria that we don't have to deal with. But 1972, not used in this country. 1973, the human worm was put on the endangered species list. Happy to tell you that through a recovery action, through the getting rid of the pesticide, through conservation and education, these birds were taken off the endangered species list in 1999. They're doing great. Now, where can we find them? They like big areas. They, <laughs> oh, she got it. Uh, they like large space because they wanted to get enough space to die. Yeah, no, get in quick. Yeah. Uh, so go up to like the North Shore of Minnesota on the bluffs. Go down by our river bluffs here. Buildings and skyscrapers right here in Minneapolis and St. Paul are also great, great habitat for these guys. They like ledges. They don't make a stick nest. They just find a ledge, they move the soil, they put between one and five eggs down. Um, they will steal nests, like they will steal nests such as raven nests or crow nests. Um, and I've had the opportunity to ban birds that have gone to their nests um, as well. So they, uh, I've gone to their nests and banned them up in northern Minnesota when I used to work there. And it was actually an old raven's nest. So we do monitor, uh, we work uh, the organization is called the Midwest Peregrine Society. They're a nonprofit, and they ban and monitor all the nesting peregrine falcons in like seven states and parts of Canada. And then we can take the blood samples and we, we help out a little bit. But they're the main organization called the Midwest Peregrine Society. Um, if you wouldn't mind making a little behind instead of going behind me, that would be appreciated. Um, what other questions? Did she get cold? Because I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, they actually really do not. They are migratory. Now the big thing about birds, think about birds, they don't migrate because of cold. Birds migrate because of food. So, they are migrating because of food because, well, there's no insects. So a lot of small birds leave, and since they only eat small birds, they don't eat fish or mice. They have to leave and follow the birds. Arctic peregrines living way far north can travel over 7,000 miles to the rainforest of Argentina. And then they're going to come 7,000 miles back to breed, and they do that year after year after year. So, um, cold levels, no, not really. Um, these birds can really take it. Yeah. So. We even have peregrines here in Minnesota and that you can observe all winter long. It's not food, and it's not cold, it's food. Um, down by uh, Lock and Dam number one, down by the Ford Park plant, there's peregrines that usually stay all winter because there's enough uh, waterfowl, ducks, and things that stay because the dam keeps water open. Um, they are not cold blooded, they are still warm blooded, so they still can, uh, they still produce their own heat. And um, so, what that says is they just need the calories, the food to do so. So, in the wintertime, we have to bump up the number of calories, and in the summertime, we just bump them down low. We weigh our birds every single day, the bigger birds. And that we, or I'm sorry, the smaller birds every day, these guys we usually do about two to three times a week, which we have such a demand for programs, they get weighed about every day. Um, and that we can monitor. And we can determine, are they at a healthy weight? Are they need some more? Are they need to be less? We can't have heavy birds. We can't have light birds. So it's knowing the individual. It's knowing the species. And it's just uh, also knowing just how to take care of them. So, yeah. Question, yeah, go for it. How do you know or how do you decide which birds are going to be used for the purpose that she's used for? Like, just the ones that are non-releasable all get trained or only specific ones? That's a great question. Asking about which birds and how do we determine. Um, first of all, I should just mention the Raptor Center on my department. We are pretty much maxed out of what we can take. There are other birds that need homes. So our clinical staff so well trained that they can determine um, uh, that the bird is number one going to be captive, uh, need to be captive, that they're going to be non-releasable. And then, uh, you know, they're working alongside with these organizations. Places will call and say, yeah, I really would like a peregrine falcon. And then we want to make sure it's the right fit, both for the bird. Oh, there we go. <laughs> both for the bird as well as for the organization. So that's where our clinical manager will talk with them, make sure it's the right fit. And if it is, then we send it to them. Yeah. We don't, don't send them out to anybody. No. Do they live alone? Or do they like them? These are very solitary animals. Um, and so these birds, they uh, they are going to live alone. They're going to come together for courtship and mating in that time of the year, and then they're going to leave. Um, so they don't, they don't, uh, uh, yes, they don't, they don't live in flocks and things like that. that you think of other birds. Um, it doesn't mean like you know you drive down the highways. I see red tails sitting up on the light post. I've occasionally seen like two red tails up on the light post together. That could be like a sibling. That could be maybe a mating pair. But for the most part, not nah, live alone. Take care of yourself. Take care of your young, your young, and that's it. Does she have a mate? Um, she does not. We are not a breeding facility. No, I'm glad you asked that. Um, she does not mate. Um, we, our mission, rehabilitation education. It's does not. Does she have like a buddy? 
Um, no. <laughs> Sorry, no. She doesn't look for that. All she cares about is the food. Um, so, okay. So. The video, no. Um, the video, you saw those cages first come in, and then they can, as they're going through rehabilitation, they start building up to different enclosures. So wherever they come in, they have a smaller space, they don't hurt themselves. And then as they get bigger and wings and everything are working better, they can go to flight rooms, to then flight um, pens. And then we actually fly birds on crayon lines. Very long lines that um, we go out to a field at the university, you can come see it happen. We put the line, um, we put them in with equipment, just like this, and then we let the bird fly. And then we can determine and evaluate the flight if they're ready for release. Um, that happens right outside the student center at the university on the St. Paul campus. There's no time, but if you happen to go over there, you may see it. Um, and then um, eagles we do at the Humble Lake area. Um, but, uh, and then, uh, then they build up the flight pens. Where we work in our department, she has very large enclosures that we call views. And she has a very large space. She lives alone. I mean, she has her own area. We don't breed, so we don't put together. And you have to be careful. If I were to put a kestrel together with the peregrine, well, you come back and only have a peregrine left. So we have to be careful. <laughs> They're going to eat each other, but also we don't want to breed. So a um, very large enclosure, and she can have her perches, she can have her water pan, and then, uh, but, but also note, note that 80 to 90% of a raptor's day is this, sitting and perching. They're not just flying around looking for food because they're burning more calories. So they take advantage of when they can see it. So they, they, they'll fly high, they'll look down, they'll take advantage of that. So 80 to 90% is sitting and perching. I was going to say, do they ever land on like, the ground or something? Yeah. Typically not. Um, they will go on like the, the rough surfaces, their, their, their ledges. They will like perch on that. Um, and that helps to wear down their, their talons. It's a... Uh, um, she may do something, so watch her in a second here. Um, but, uh, yeah, I may be wrong. But, uh, but she also, uh, but yeah, so they definitely like, they're not like a much of a tree branching bird. They like flat surfaces. So even when we perch them, we have very large flat purchases for those big, long, peregrine flat feet. We have to know the individual. So like a hawk, nice, uh, nice um, you know, branch type of perch. But, uh, but this one, much more flat. flat. <laughs> Any other questions? So do they, um, I know that you said that they, she doesn't have like a buddy. Yeah. Do, 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 like, do the females, do they not get along? Or, um, or just that they're solitary and it's just yeah. not in their nature? I would say certainly the individuals. I mean, I'll walk a couple, we have a couple different, we have uh, three female pairs right now. Um, and so if I walk this pair by <laughs> another one or the other one by this one, um, we'll see them react. It can be a little bit of territorial um, posturing. So you'll see that happen. Um, bless you. <laughs> um, so we will see that kind of behavior, but for the most part, I mean, I can bring them to a, a booth, and, and we talked about too about you know if we're going to be out here, I can tether on a perch. I can tether her, leave enough space. I can tether another one. They sort of are just used to seeing each other every single day. We pass eagles, we pass by hawks, we pass by owls, um, and uh, it's no individual. We have one peregrine. She doesn't like. Um, eagle so much, she starts to scream and do some of her um, warning vocalizations. <laughs> so we honor that by avoiding her seeing the eagles. It's why, why increase stress? Why have her go through that? So it's know that individual. Now we could train that. I could train her to tolerate that. It just takes time and, you know, the food, but um, so, oh, sorry, one more. Um, <laughs> questions? Does she ever nip at your fingers? Because you talk a lot with your hair. I do. Uh, um, I am careful. Um, we do, uh, we, I do wear the glove for that reason, as I mentioned, but also, um, the thing is, is that with raptors, just like any animal, if they feel threatened, they have two options, fight or flight. And these birds, most of the time, their number one thing they're going to do is choose flight first. Get away. Get away first. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh yay! That's a <laughs> Oh, he's going to think that's so cool. <laughs> thank you. We can do photos, too, if you guys want to. Uh, so, they will do fight or flight response. They're going to get away first. If they feel so threatened that they can't, well, then it's fight. First thing they use, feet. These feet, I'll give you, I'll give you perspective. Um, Greyhorn owls, for instance, if, if they close, eagles, if any of them, even these guys too, um, if we had opened their foot for a medical procedure, um, their feet, a lot of ligaments, they just close. It's easy for a raptor to close, it's more difficult to open. They have to, they have to send those signals from the brain and foot. It's natural for them to close. If they catch that bird and it struggles, well, they're just going to close tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, so if we have to open their foot for a procedure, you can get it open. And I'm not exaggerating to say, you have to use all of your strength to open those toes up. Okay? Um, so if, 
I can easily get grabbed by their feet. I am very careful where I put my hand. I do not want to get grabbed by those feet. It's called footing. Um, and the other thing is that they will bite. That's their third response. Um, and so they will use uh, watch something. Um, the, the third, uh, so use that beat. And as you just saw what you did with that quail, and she ate every bone of that quail, I don't want to get my hand anywhere by that beat. So. Any other questions? How long till you can actually like get the bird for it to perch on your hand like that? Um, you know, with her, she's such a solid bird. We do this every day. She's done this her whole life. Um, is that I could stand here all day um, until something hot comes. You know, if something spooks her, you know. But um, and I read the bird. What you know, what's nice working with them is what you see is what you get. They wear their their emotions on their wings. Okay. If she seems hungry, she's hungry. If she seems scared, she's scared. You know, I could be scared, but I could I could hide that. Um, she doesn't. So if let's say something's happening or she's just done, I honor that. I put her back and we're done. And programs know that. If I go to a program in a school and it's just not happening, the birds come number one. And that's the thing. So if we have to cut a program short, if I have to, you know, maybe the program, you know, if I just have to talk or take more, bring up people for, um, you know, participation and just maybe the bird isn't out as long, that's just the way that it is in working with animals. You know, they, they tell me how long. Since her wing is hurt, can she fly? Uh, not good enough. We say limited flight. Sure, she could hop for here. She could get to that tree. But can she fly on the line? We do not, actually. She was at probably early on. She probably was evaluated that way. We just don't. I mean, we can't exercise them like they would in the wild. Um, we give enrichment, both mind and body, um, different forms of enrichment, training, programs, toys, water pans, how we deliver food, what we deliver. Um, and so with that, um, that's how we can give that. But no, she doesn't get to fly like she used to. Um, we wish she could, but she can't. Yeah. Adam, yeah. Um, the class knows that I do some volunteer work with the Wildcat Sanctuary. And sometimes you, um, you give this bird a name, and sometimes people criticize the, the sanctuary. Every every animal up there we talk to by name. Sure. Explain it. Sure. Um, mentioning that too, naming birds, and yeah, you'll get opinions at every different type of organization. Some will say name. Oh, get ready, get ready. Like, Ralph, here we go, here we go. Snap it. <laughs> Natural behavior. Um, so, um, how we feel of it is number one, we have 33 birds. It helps us do our work, number one. I mean, we could call it a number. We could get our case number, you know, case number, whatever, whatever, whatever is going to handle law school today. We could do that. But there's also that element of connection. We want to connect to people, and we do that by using names. So, we can connect. This is Juno. We have also Artemis, goddess of the hunt. We have Annie. We have different names. Now, we, you know, when it comes to names, we've kind of changed our policy a little bit that we want to make it educational. Um, so we are changing some. So when people ask us, what's the name, um, we can then te make that a teachable moment as well. Um, so some places use numbers. Some places don't name. I could just call her, this is, this is the parent phone. It's P.F. Yeah, parent phone. And that's fine, too. Everybody does, you know, different, uh, different philosophies and feelings about that. If she got away from you and decided to go hang out in that tree, would she ever come back? No, or? no, she's not trying to. <laughs> so, no, I have a leash. She's going to pee. So, no. Um, it's giving her ideas. It doesn't, it doesn't mean she couldn't try to lure down with food or things like that. Or even to the point that maybe it's just she's so uncomfortable, I'm a familiar thing. She may kind of come back or let me get close to her. Yeah. Do you get to pick which um, bird to bring to these? Picking the birds, um, I look at it as, yeah, I can pick, um, you know, certainly the ones I, you know, I work with all of them. Um, I sort of more I look at that. I could pay more for a different bird. <laughs> there is that, let's be honest. So there are some different, uh, different when it comes to payment. But also, um, it also has to do with, um, I have to think about what the scenario is. We're talking about, what we were talking about in the classroom, I thought, bringing a peregrine, bird that was near extinction bird that is protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and was protected under the Endangered Species Act, if that is a great example of what we're talking about. Second is, how is she going to do in this environment? I kind of got a nice um, kind of description of, of the space. With this space, I could really brought anybody. Um, you know, if we were going to be in that room, that was a little more difficult for some birds, just with the projection and the, and the tables. So I try to ask those questions and try to determine what's the best fit for everybody. Um, so, so no, we have, we have some leeway, but then we have a lot of handlers, and so sometimes they can handle, we have part-time handlers, or maybe they can handle certain birds, so I have to let them because I can handle any of the birds kind of thing. So we have to work along all of our programming as well. What else? What else? Questions? Uh, does she have colored vision, or does she see black and white? Great question. Vision. Color vision. She does see in color. Um, okay. Owls have definitely more 
you think rods and cones, um, and cones are color, if I recall. Um, owls, for instance, more rods, see in low light, but they also do have some of the, some of the color as well. Um, and she has phenomenal vision. Um, you know, just imagine seeing a pigeon from 3,000 feet, watching it, and flying down and grabbing it for dinner. Anything else? Using gravity, they're using their adaptations. Um, you can see, look at the chest now, a little bit bulging out. All that quail is sitting right there. Right? <laughs> Anything else? So I come to the Raptor Center. Um, come visit us. Come uh, volunteer if that interests you. Come to our release. May Aren't 5th. Are you right by the other yeah. equine center also? We are close to the equine center. So part of the College of Veterans Medicine. If you ever bring your dog to the, what's it called? The uh, small animal hospital. We're literally across the street. Or your cat. Yep, or your cat. <laughs> um, equine center is just down the block. Um, the, the hospital's there. Um, so, yeah. I have to take photos if you guys want.